Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 154 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. The beginning of May always means medievalists perform their annual pilgrimage to the sunny campus of the University of Western Michigan in Kalamazoo to talk about their favorite things, share new ideas, reconnect with old friends, and make new connections. Although it was a virtual pilgrimage this year, medievalists from all over the world still managed to come together and bring their new findings to share with the community. This week, Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net and I got together for one more Zoom to talk about some of our favorite papers, some of the exciting new research going on in the field, and how we see things changing. Our field report from Kalamazoo is coming up right after this. Well, Peter, it is like an hour since we turned off our Zoom cameras <laughs> from day six of Kalamazoo, and we are back on Zoom again to talk about Kalamazoo. So oh. how was your Kalamazoo, Peter? Uh, you know, it was okay. I think I was a little underwhelmed this year, and there's lots of reasons for that, but heard some good papers, heard some okay papers. I'll be really glad to get back to going conferences in person. That's true. It wasn't the same. And I mean, we haven't been for years now because of the pandemic, but this was a particularly long conference. Like this was yeah. six days of Zoom, which is the longest Kalamazoo ever. And you and I went to most sessions, most days yeah. looking for good papers and stuff. So like that was a long haul. But as you say, there were lots of good papers to listen to. The conference starts every day at 9 a.m. New sessions every two hours all the way till 8.30, I guess, because there's 7 to 8.30. And you don't have to attend them all, but there's like lots of them that you want to. And then it's a huge slog. Like, I don't think anyone is out there doing like 12 hours of conferencing for six days straight. Yeah, there were a couple of days I did pretty much 12 hours of conference. You have like half an hour in between to grab a snack, but yeah, it's all day. But let's talk about some of the things that we noticed overall and some of the papers that we thought were really good. So For me, overall, I thought it was really great. I feel like we're moving forward in the field where when I first started going to Kalamazoo, this is going to date me, was 2005. And since then, I feel like there is just a much wider range of the type of papers that we have. Like there's this focus on the global Middle Ages and there's this focus on different perspectives. And I think that has a lot to do with the scholars that are coming up. Mm -hmm. But it was really nice to see that overall. There was a whole range of perspectives and more interdisciplinary stuff, which I think is really important. So I like to go to sessions on social stuff. Like I go to sessions on poverty. I go to sessions on medicine. I go to sessions on the global middle ages. So that kind of stuff, I could see more interdisciplinarity. And I, I love that when you start to have people who are talking to scientists, you know, or, or talking to people who work with statistics, this stuff is really exciting to me. And I think it makes the whole field better. Yeah, there's a, a lot of papers who are talking about the different approaches they have to like trying to solve questions using different using evidence, right? Maybe someone's using Google Maps, or biotechnology, things like that. You're starting to see in like academic papers and stuff like that. But people here like trying to figure out how to use it to the best of their knowledge. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's great when you have a session like that where people talk about stuff like I think you're talking about Michael Livingston talking about Google Earth and how you can use this to look at battlefields. Mm -hmm. And Michael went through everything and explained how that worked. And so that makes it so that everyone else can pick up his tips, right, and use them to look at battlefields on their own. So that kind of sharing of knowledge is something you only get a couple times a year at these conferences. And it's too bad we can't have these chats over lunch when we're doing the Zoom thing. (laughs) But I think it's still great that we're getting together and sharing this knowledge with each other. Exactly. It's always fun to see, like, here's what I'm doing. Here's my approach. And you're going to learn a lot just about the methods of scholarship, right? So that, mm-hmm. that is always an exciting thing to look at. Mm-hmm. One of the most exciting things that I saw, and I came across this in two different papers. The first one that I saw this discussion in was in a talk by Sarah Fiddyman, and she was talking about picking up DNA from parchment using those PVC erasers. Like this is something I had no idea was a thing. And it was in at least two different sessions, people talking about getting DNA off these little PVC erasers and that making a huge difference in being able to find out more about parchment without damaging it. That's fascinating. 
that was really, really cool. I think you see that kind of research where people are picking up little bits of knowledge. And as they said, it was almost like uh, accidental discovery. Mm -hmm. And I quite like that. I kind of like that in that we get to learn where they're going from. And, and people can kind of throw out ideas. You're talking about this. Here's how I can add to it with my bit of knowledge. So I love, there's always that with the kind of questions and answers afterwards. Doing it live, you do get a lot of other insights. Yeah, you often hear in the Q&A part of the sessions, people saying, can you drop your contact information? Because I have some stuff for you that I think will be helpful. And uh, of course, I love that kind of good vibes that you have when you have scholars getting together and, and genuinely wanting to share and make things move forward. So I love that kind of stuff. Were there any standout papers for you? All the plenaries were really quite interesting. Yeah. Geraldine Hang talking about this ship discovered in Indonesia, off the kind of coast of Indonesia, that kind of shows the level of trade between 8th century China and the Middle East, which was taking kind of one piece and then starting to make connections, right? Physical evidence to other kind of documents and sources and discovering kind of new things. And just the idea that we have kind of an industrialization in the 8th century in the Tang Dynasty with the creating of this uh, ceramics for export. I wouldn't even thought there's, that there's an export market developed in China for almost halfway around the world. <laughs> Well, what's cool about that shipwreck is even if you have a sense that there is this trade going on, sometimes you don't have that physical evidence until you come across something like a shipwreck. And so this was able to make it so that scholars like Geraldine Hank can look at this and say, wow, look at look at the trade. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. happening. You actually have the physical evidence to go with it. Yeah, that was an amazing plenary. And she actually shared the article. So a whole bunch of us are going to be reading the article. And I'm glad that you brought up Geraldine Hang because she had a couple other sessions that were related to work that she's doing where Cambridge University Press is putting out some very small books they're calling elements instead of books that talk about the global Middle Ages. So I went to a couple of sessions on those and I got to tell you, they were so great because they're just introductory pieces that tell you a little bit about global medieval history. So that time period that people call the European Middle Ages. And man, so much great scholarship going on there. So I shared that on my social media, but we should drop this in the show notes, Peter, because not only are these a lower price point than a lot of academic writing, but they're also free in the first two weeks that each of these comes out. So the ones that are out now, I think have passed that time period, but as they come out, they're gonna be free for two weeks every time oh. a new one drops. And I think we all need to know more about the global middle ages. So this is very exciting, as you can tell from the way I'm talking about <laughs> it. <laughs> it was great to go to those sessions. I couldn't attend those sessions. The one other thing I was really looking forward to, maybe you can offer is the, is the Oceana. Yeah. One of the books, like in Oceania from year 1100 to 1800. Yeah. That's something that very few medievalists have even an idea about. And there's a whole world there to explore. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is something that we didn't have represented in past Kalamazoo. So it's nice to have work on Oceania coming to the forefront. And I think it's going to happen more as we move forward. But I mean, change takes time. So it's nice to see this happening now. And yes, yes, we've got our hands on a copy of that element. and I cannot wait to read it. It's going to be so exciting. Yeah, all of the speakers. I'm not dropping names only because there were so many of them in the session. There's probably like 16 people worth of names. But let's drop that link, Peter, on the show notes so people can check out that series. For sure, for sure. Another plenary that I loved, because of course I loved it, was Ruth Mazo Karras's one. Mm -hmm. And she's always amazing. She was talking about the Archdiocese of Armagh in Ireland and talking about marriage cases there, because of course that's the focus of her work, and talking about people wanting to dissolve their marriages on the basis of force and fear. And what I always love about the way that Ruth comes at things is she doesn't take anything at face value, right? So she's looking at the cases individually and saying, well, why would somebody be using this as their argument? Is this the truth? They were forced, they were feeling fear, or is this a strategy? Because in legal records, you often have the same formula that people use as legal strategy. So she's looking at this very, very carefully to see what this means or are there patterns we could recognize? And so her looking at canon law is always exciting to me. And I thought she did a really great job in that session and brought up a whole bunch of really interesting points. Again, like I thought the 
if with that one, the question and answer period afterwards really put a lot of insights as people are asking about how do we work about the legalese language of these texts, how people act, fathers, mothers, grandfathers, are these situations very unique to Ireland or they're not? You know, you learn quite a lot about what this set of text tells us and how does it also apply to other parts of, say, medieval Europe? Yeah. And she was really bringing up the problems and the things you need to think about with using the word agency, which we use a lot, especially when we're reclaiming women's history. What is their agency? And when we when we use this word agency, can it be problematic, right? Because if all of a sudden we're saying women have agency, does that mean that they're in trouble? They're not using their agency. So it was a really exciting discussion about terminology and ways of looking at the past. And of course, she always looks at things in just a very careful way, kind of assuming nothing and seeing what the possibilities can be. Ruth always kind of hits it out of the ballpark every time yeah. she speaks. And quite a large number of people come in and tune in because it is a plenary. I'm glad it gets a lot of attention. Absolutely. Were there other papers that stood out to you? Yeah, I did a lot of the military sessions. I'm a member of the Dairy Military. So I heard a paper by uh, Robin McCallum that kind of looked at the city of London and dealing with Edward II. As Edward II goes on, on all these wars, he needs money, right? Mm -hmm. So he winds up having to ask for loans from the city. And he goes through like the kind of process of why are officials from the city agreeing to these loans? What are they getting out of it? What is the kind of politics behind it? It was kind of interesting to me because I had done a little research, but not that thorough in, in that area. So I was like, oh man, this is, this is really <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> You know, with military papers, there's a kind of a subgroup of us that really love this stuff and find it kind of fascinating. But I also think it shows you kind of the ways we're looking at different sources and different ways of looking at records. So even like the kind of economic stuff is really fascinating to me. Well, London and economics are two of your favorite things. So that's very exciting. I've always had this kind of interest in London's history and I always love it when people are kind of working on that area and they go into the little nitty gritty details. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And speaking of military history, I went to Cliff Rogers paper that was talking about gunpowder. And that was really interesting to me because again, this is kind of interdisciplinary. So Cliff Rogers teaches at West Point. So he has access to people who can help him test actual gunpowder and weapons. So that was really cool because Cliff was trying to test out some differences in opinion that people had about what the ratios of gunpowder were and how people were thinking, if you added stuff to this, was it efficacious or not? Is it going to actually improve the charge for this particular cannon? And some people had said, these additives don't make a difference. Well, they tested them at West Point and they do make <laughs> a difference. And I'm not going to give ratios here on the podcast. I'm sure people can look up how to make gunpowder on the internet, yeah. but I'm not going to participate in that. <laughs> what? But in conclusion, Cliff found out that people in the Middle Ages, they knew what they were talking about when it came to gunpowder. And of course, that makes sense. But again, like I was talking about with the shipwreck, you can have ideas about what makes sense and have faith that this thing is happening in the Middle Ages. But to actually have that scientific proof is amazing. It's good to have that evidence. So I really enjoyed that paper. And I always like Cliff's papers because, again, he really wants to measure things precisely. And that I think that attention to detail is really invaluable. Yeah, Cliff is able to kind of focus and look at the very small details. And he's a big numbers guy. So uh, yeah, I love it. I always love his work. Mm -hmm. A paper I really had fun with was Kendra Brown talking about fish nights. <laughs> Yes, fish nights or night fish. <laughs> night, night fish. <laughs> a lot of medieval literature talks about people who live under the sea. We have tales of mermaids and mermen and tritons and uh, sirens and all sorts of stuff. And they tend to get illuminated in manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So Kendra is taking a look at all the kind of depictions of these she's in the night fish camp i believe right <laughs> as in they are knights first and fish second instead of being fish first who are also knights how do they look what do you see in their helmets and coverings there's differences between women and men here and i was also blown away that like some of the manuscripts are basically identical and it's from the same shop so mm -hmm. they just have a pattern already one manuscript Another manuscript, the third manuscript, they all look basically the same, which is like a couple of very, very minor details in how these guys look, but very meme-worthy. Yeah, it was like this one artist became really good at drawing 
a knight who was also a fish. So he drew a knight that was also a fish in a whole bunch of different manuscripts. Yeah. And those are always so cute to see. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. They, they, they were adorable. They found so many examples. That's one thing that you, now that you're able to see a lot of manuscripts online is you're able to start tracking down and, and getting more and more examples of what you're looking for, right? 30 years ago, people say, well, I've, I found this in one manuscript and it's kind of off and weird, but now you kind of see it well. It, it comes again and again. Yeah, and that's a great point. And something I wanted to bring up was pretty much every day during the conference, there was a session where you could go to a virtual museum visit. So they had different museums who were participating. And I went to the one on ivories at the Met Museum at quote unquote, at the Met Museum. And so we were looking at ivories. And again, there was a, a crowdsourcing of an object, which I should probably put on the show notes as well. And I've forgotten the name of the scholar off the top of my head. So we'll have to put that in later. But there's an object that looks like a mortar. It's probably not a mortar, but no one can figure out what it is. So she was crowdsourcing ideas like, what is this possible thing? But Scott Miller was a scholar who was showing us two ivory mirror backs. And I had always thought, and I think other people had thought this too, that you have a mirror back made of ivory or something, and then you have the mirror on the other side of it. And that's it. Like it's a two-sided object. But Scott was showing us that these two mirror backs went together and they actually twisted together to form kind of a compact. Like you have a mirror oh. inside two pieces of ivory that were carved and it was keeping the mirror nice and contained within there. But because most mirror backs are just solo, you could never see this. And she's showing yeah. us the mechanism of how this worked together. So if any organizers of Kalamazoo are listening to this, the museum visit where we could see artifacts and ask questions and have curators show us the objects in real time was really valuable. So I think they yeah. should do that again. Yeah, I definitely think so. A lot of us aren't able to travel, in this case, around the United States, you know, museums and stuff. And yeah, we can say, hey, here, here's some things that could be useful for our research or, or just for our interest. Mm -hmm. So one of the papers I really liked was by Daniel James Berardino. And he was looking at 12th and early 13th century Byzantium. And there's an idea there that the Byzantines were kind of in a commonwealth, like had, had these natural allies, the Rus, Serbia, Bulgaria. And he's kind of just taking a look at how this one chronicler, one of the main chroniclers from the period, how he can take a look at these groups. And are they really allies? Does he perceive them as allies? And he doesn't trust the Bulgarians or the Rus or the Serbs. He has different ideas of what who are the kind of natural allies of the Byzantines. And uh, he kind of you know points to Georgians, the Latins, which Western European, they kind of serve as mercenaries. They serve as more loyal to the emperor, and that makes them a good qualities. And he's just trying to spell the notion that just because certain groups hold these kind of similar religious values or have those kind of connections, that that makes them in political and military terms uh, associated with them. You can't do that. You have to kind of look at the, the evidence for that. So I thought that was a really useful paper for a military person like me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there have been assumptions for 150 years or however long this medieval obsession has been lasting where people just made assumptions based on, well, this makes sense, but they haven't interrogated the evidence. So let's look at this more closely. That kind of thing is a good thing. And that brings me to Monica Green, who I shared a bunch of sessions with. I was sitting in on them anyway. I wasn't doing any speaking. But Monica Green is, of course, a superstar. And she got to talk about pandemics and how we should look at them as medievalists in a couple of sessions. So we got to see her phylogenetic trees, which are amazing. But I thought it was really good for her to remind us that we need to look at things like the big picture and the small picture, and we need to interrogate these things individually and in a way that incorporates different disciplines, like I was talking about before. One thing that she just kind of dropped in one of her sessions was, for her, the momentous occasions that mark out the Middle Ages are volcanic. But interestingly for her, it's still that same thousand year period. Like there is a big amount of volcanic activity around 500 and around 1500. There's still volcanic activity that kind of bookends that period. I thought that was just kind of fascinating. Yeah, she's, she's looking at the mass movements of, in her case, like diseases, like leprosy. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad that she's working on a book, The Black Death, like Global History. Mm -hmm. 
obviously she seems to be the best person in the field just to do that right now. So I'm looking forward to that. I think that we should also drop in the show notes, Monica's bibliography, because she has a running bibliography of good work on the Black Death. And if people haven't seen that, like they're not on her Twitter or something, we should put that in the show notes so that people can look at that and access that as well, because she is the world's foremost expert on this second plague pandemic. One of the good things when you go to a conference and they can highlight the people that are really kind of the superstars in the field and in a sense draws people and like inspires people. I think a lot of people have now moved into the medical and biological areas, looking at the success that she's had following in that and learning more too. Yeah. And not just being inspired, but actually finding ways to do it so that path has already been blazed so she shows us ways that you can actually follow in her footsteps you know she's already made the contacts or she's already shown the science that is necessary for us to understand so it's not even just being inspired but finding practical ways to follow her lead which i think is very generous of her to share in the ways that we were talking about other scholars also sharing their knowledge and how to use tools to advance the field mentioned earlier about Michael Livingston, he did very similar where he's trying to figure out if battlefields, medieval battlefields are really where we think they are. And he's like, all right, we have to take a look at a bunch of different tools in our way. And that's why you say he's kind of looking at Google Maps. You have to have a better than a baseline view, uh, understanding of these Google Maps, because you have to understand where, oh, where they're getting it wrong. You kind of mentioned that it looks like there's a hill on Google Maps, but this is actually just trees, mm -hmm. or you're seeing man-made objects causing that kind of changes in the map. So you have to look at that, but also be skeptical of that kind of knowledge. It was fascinating to see how he starts piecing things together. Mm -hmm. And that was his entire talk was, let me show you how I did this, which yeah. I think was very useful for people who are coming up in the field. Mm -hmm. And especially in this time where it's hard to travel, it's hard for us to stomp around on old battlefields. So we have to rely on tools like Google Earth. I think a conference succeeds when people come in and they learn new methods, right? It's kind of hard to go into a conference paper, give a 20 man paper and say, I've discovered this whole new uh, genre of literature or something like that. But I think we would do this work in kind of piecemeal fashion. And I think it's learning about the little tricks of the trade as historians, as scholars that we get the most out of from going to a conference like this. Now you were saying you were a bit underwhelmed this year. Tell me about that. What's going on? A lot of the papers that I heard when I say piecemeal, they were very piecemeal. The research didn't seem quite complete. In other cases, they weren't really going after any kind of anything particularly new to say. And I don't want to throw anyone under a bus, but I think sometimes, especially if you have like a round table, that can be a hint at, I'm only going to talk for five minutes, so I'm just going to say a few nice words. <laughs> You're not talking about your paper, are you? Because you did say oh. last week that you were not finished writing it. <laughs> Tell us about your paper. How did it go? I'll let you figure out how it went. But I was basically just talking about this 13th century work called the Book of Charlatans and what it actually says about medieval warfare. And Book of Charlatans is really a book about crimes and cons that this person saw and recorded in the medieval Middle East. And he probably was a uh, con artist himself, but he, he does devote a chapter to warfare. And I was really fascinated uh, about the way he described items you could put on a sword, basically the creation of liquids that you would dip your sword into. One was kind of a pretty obvious one, which is onion juice. <laughs> so I don't know if that's obvious. <laughs> I just thought that was, you know, hey, that's a good idea. I think everyone should put onion juice on their swords. But the other one was this much more little complex. There's only like three ingredients, but the idea that you could cook it up and in his words, was going to make the sword better. I was really kind of hamstruck on what it would have actually done. And I was really glad there was people who like, they came in on a session saying, well, it probably did this. It was kind of a hardening because I'm looking at it from this literary perspective. And there's people that can come in like Cliff Rogers and say, we've done these tests and swords can be changed, physically changed. I enjoyed that. And every time I give a paper, I just try to be a little entertaining. <laughs> yeah, well, you were talking about the Book of Charlatans, so there were lots of examples you could pull out of trickery and stuff. Yeah. But I thought it was a good example of bringing forth a text that maybe other people hadn't heard of before and showing how 
it's relevant to what people are studying now. And I thought that the Q&A was really good because you had a couple of people saying these ingredients that you're quenching sword in are poisonous. <laughs> that might be a reason why you want to temper your sword with it. When I do give, me, give these papers, it's often it's where I want to introduce people to the text. Hey, this is out there and I think it's really interesting. Medieval military historian, would we ever be looking at a book of con artistry from the 13th century? Probably not. I always kind of find it fun to throw that out there. You're there to throw out new sources and I'm there to pull out new sources. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there as a scout and I've got a whole bunch of new information and people that would be amazing podcast guests. So I have my work cut out for me for the next week or so reaching out to people and finding out if they want to talk about this stuff on the podcast, because, wow, this stuff was fascinating. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, you hear that people talk and say, really, this should be something that the wider audience would know about. That's one of the reasons Medievalist.net exists was, you know, to kind of spread that message. These days, people do a lot on social media, but I think the podcast is, is a super way of talking about this in more detail and, and say, hey, here's my new research. Mm -hmm. And I found that that has changed the way that I attend these conferences because I used to go and just go to sessions that had to do with my own work. So I would be seeing very similar stuff over and over again because it was very niche. But now I'm going to hear sessions about stuff that I think the wider public should learn about. And it's expanded the kind of session I go to. And it's just very exciting for me. And I hope I'm going to have all sorts of people that everyone else is going to find exciting to listen to. I was there to mine for content, and I think there was a lot of rich content there. <laughs> I remember in my previous years, I take entire notebooks full of notes for these conferences. And I just love to scoop up that information. I don't do that as much anymore. Uh, I, I kind of sit back and listen and think to myself, oh, this, this is interesting. Let me get an email. If there's a particular source, oh, let me find what they're talking about. So I love it when they kind of name drop books and name drop sources. Yeah, I'm always writing down a source that people have mentioned that's useful. And that's another thing that I think our colleagues are very generous about is dropping books in the chat for people to pick up and learn about and read more. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are always lots of conference discounts. So if you went to Kalamazoo and you haven't picked up your books, it's time to visit the publishers and get all those delicious discounts. That's the thing I miss most about being in person in Kalamazoo is the book room. Yeah, we usually carpooled and came back with a whole back seat <laughs> full of books. Yeah, yeah. The wonderful days, especially the final day when it's not a big sale. It sounds like there's going to be some big improvements to the campus for next year. Some of the places that were like mainstays are no longer there. It sounds like the hybrid format is probably going to be here to stay. There are a lot of people that say, hey, I can't go to Kalamazoo physically. And this being able to go online is the only way I can do it. And they can access it that way. And so I think the conference wants to have that be inclusive and have people be able to come out and join them. Yeah, and I think that is going to make it so that we are forevermore going to have six-day Kalamazoo's because it's going to make it more accessible to people internationally to be part of Kalamazoo. And I think that is only to the good. I think that it's going to make the conference even better. Who knows if we are going to be there in person next year or not, but we are definitely going to attend in some version. Indeed, I will be uh, attending the International Medieval Congress in person, and I know that is a hybrid format. I'll be interested in experience on how it goes from when you're actually there, the technical side of bringing people online to watch it as well. Well, do you have any news for us on what's on the website this week? We have a piece by Lucie Le Bonnier on illegitimate children in uh, medieval France, looking at the perceptions of that group. We have a piece from a you on Christine de Pizan. An oldie but a goodie. Yes, yes, we have that. And it's something I was just caught up today on the Battle of Ensign. What's that? Tell me about it. It's not a real battle. It's a parody of a medieval battle. <laughs> Written in the early 14th century. It's a little sh short little poem. But it's pretty funny and pretty weird. So I'll leave the readers to read it. But not everyone liked war in the Middle Ages. So here's a, a person that wrote a fun little piece talking about how silly war is. Yes. It's always a time to make that point. Not everyone liked war in the <laughs> Middle Ages. Awesome. Well, thanks, Peter. I think it's time for us to get off Zoom. <laughs> yes. Yeah, time to look at physical things. I'm going to re read a book, I think. Yeah. Look at some grass or trees or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go outside. That's good. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, Peter. Thanks.
Thank you to all of Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for your support each month. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and the newly reborn Medieval World, formerly known as Medieval Warfare Magazine, as well as a book club and exclusive maps of the Medieval World by Tina Ross. Patronage funds this podcast as well as Medievalist.net's other work, so thank you. For those of you who are interested in trying out the new Medieval World magazine and supporting this podcast, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from Kalamazoo to zoo archaeology, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sobolski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Music